and I looked to Charlie Coverman, Brasenose College, and the current treasurer of the Oxford Union to open the case for the proposition. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President, for allowing me the opportunity to take part in this presidential debate, something I honestly didn't think was even possible but a few months ago. Your constant guidance, support and friendship over the past year, and this term in particular, is something I value immensely, uh, and it really does mean a lot to me, so thank you very much. But we are here today to discuss something that is much more important than is first obvious from the motion at hand. Indeed, the world is at a turning point. There are two crises that can make or break humanity and society as we know it. Extreme wealth inequality and climate breakdown. Billionaires and the ultra-rich are inextricably connected to these two issues, as is a capitalist system as a whole. It would be outside of the scope of this debate, however, to put capitalism as a system on trial. But I will be putting the ultra-rich on trial. They stand accused of deepening, of deepening the gaps between the rich and poor, hoarding money and influence, exploiting the working class, the developing world, the entire planet and its natural resources. My argument will be simple. I will show, in turn, how the ultra-rich have driven extreme wealth inequality and climate, breakdown, not, um, and climate breakdown. Not only are their business pursuits responsible for driving these crises, but their personal habits and efforts to maintain the status quo are as well. Today, ladies and gentlemen, you are the jury. It is up to you to decide whether the ultra-rich are guilty of such immoralities. By voting with the eyes tonight, you are showing the world that the voters and the leaders of tomorrow have had enough of billionaires and their crimes. Though before coming to my main arguments this evening, it falls upon me to introduce the opposition speakers uh, in tonight's debate. Opening the case for the proposition is Sara Dubey, a second-year PPE student from St Hugh's College, and the librarian of the Oxford Union. Sarah shares much in common with the billionaires that she is defending this evening. <laughs> she has an immense work ethic, dominating both her IB exams and her prelims. She was educated in Dubai, a region of over 30 billionaires, the most in the Middle East. And she has an entrepreneurial mindset, some would say. So much so that she's previously pledged to introduce a remote polling station in, in North Oxford for union elections, something seemingly convenient for a candidate from St Hugh's College. <laughs> it's been great fun working with Sarah for the past couple of terms, and I look forward to hearing her speech this evening. Next up is Liam Willis, a first year PPS to Oriel College and the second elected member of the Union Secretary's Committee. It is no surprise that Liam is also defending the nepotistic status quo, <laughs> dominated by elite interests, as not only does he hail from the same college as the president-elect, but as a scouser, went to the same school as the president herself. <laughs> Though unlike Genevieve, at least Liam knows who Jurgen Klopp is. Uh, you will then hear um, You'll then hear from um, Helen Thomas, founder of her own um, macroeconomic firm um, in 2017, a former advisor to George Osborne during the financial crisis. Um, I hope her speech is more coherent than some of Osborne's editorials in the Evening Standard. <laughs> Closing the case is Peter Singer, a moral philosopher specialising in applied ethics. He approaches ethical issues from a secular, utilitarian perspective. His, his essay, Famine, Affluence, Morality, argues for a more philanthropic society. Madam President, these are your speakers, and they are, of course, most welcome. <laughs> Let us start with the, the culpability of billionaires in creating wealth inequality. You are surely familiar with the shocking statistics of wealth inequality. The richest 26 individuals have a net worth equal to the poorest 3.7 billion people. In 2018, the wealth of the 26 winners grew by 2.5 billion pounds, whilst the wealth of the losers shrunk by 11%. I look forward to the opposition's attempt to spin this figure as a beautiful product of the free market economy. 
Yet the only feeling we should have when confronted with such numbers is one of disgust. I'm not here to tell you that the people at the top are disproportionately rich. Instead, the argument is that they are responsible for keeping themselves rich and the rest poor. And there are two ways in which they do this. Firstly, keeping workers poor, and secondly, avoiding taxes. So what is an adequate wage? Workers in companies worth over a trillion dollars should never find themselves having to rely on food banks or working odd jobs to make ends meet. This was a case at Amazon before immense political pressure forced them to boost their wages. Held as a hero, Bezos raised workers' salaries to $30,000 a year, which is still less than what he earns from his Amazon share in 60 seconds. In a minute of his life, he is earning what most of his employees earn in a year. As income inequality threatens to tear American society at its seams, Bezos and his billionaire buddies are happy to sit back and watch. It is worth noting that I've only spoken about American workers so far. The picture is far worse elsewhere. Apple's mega factories in China are notorious not just for their appalling wages, but for their employee suicide rates. If political pressure has reminded the billionaires, at least for the time, that American lives are worth something, the persisting deaths in factories operating to make money for the ultra-rich elsewhere really do show their true colours. Indeed, $7.25 an hour is only the tip of the iceberg. From the sweatshops of South Asia uh, to the cobalt mines in Central Africa, the ultra-rich are happy to finance business that, that practically ensurf the poor, all while making millions per minute. Calling such conditions adequate would be an ignorant perversion of this term. Let's talk taxes. The companies generating billions and the billions, uh, billionaires themselves pay millions of dollars in taxes yearly, helping governments fund social security, healthcare, education, etc. Right? Wrong. As you may have guessed, the picture is not so simple. There are two ways in which billionaires fail to pay their taxes. Firstly, they engage in tax, tax avoidance, both as individuals and with their companies. They also lobby governments to keep taxes low, using their disproportionate influence to keep making the rich richer and the poor poorer. The tricks of tax avoidance will not be novel to this audience. Stashing wealth in tax havens, declaring a foreign company, um, declaring a company to be foreign, using legal loopholes, a commonplace, uh, not from up there, um, <laughs> Uh, using legal loopholes. <laughs> oh. I think she might be coming down. I'll have, to, I'll have to get on with my speech quickly then. Um, see, the thing is, Amazon didn't even resort to using tax havens to pay less taxes simply abusing legal provisions already under existing US federal tax law. So, how much did Amazon pay? Nothing. They paid zero dollars in US federal taxes in 2018. 500 billion dollars is dodged yearly by global corporations. This is money that could be funding social security in dozens of countries, preventing hardship and suffering. Instead, this money is kept in the hands of the corporations and the ultra-rich who control them. Individual billionaires... Uh, no, I'll not be taking points of information. Uh, individual billionaires are individually responsible. Over a third of British billionaires live in tax havens, depriving the NHS of millions of pounds that could benefit the entire country. According to a study by economists at the University of Michigan, the top 0.5% of earners in the US are the least likely to pay taxes at all. They show that approximately $50 billion was underpaid by the top 0.5% alone, and that the IRS was powerless to coerce them. The ultra-rich are simply not paying their fair share and doing everything in their power to avoid it. And this brings me on to my second point. Money brings influence, and this influence perpetuates the cycle of tax breaks and avoidance schemes for the ultra-rich. In 2017, Four companies spent the most on lobbying on tax-related issues, a total of $56 million. Microsoft, Comcast, Altria Group, and Next Extra Energy. These companies and the people who run them had a huge stake in Trump's tax plan. Their lobbying, which has been going on for decades, finally bore fruit. Trump slashed taxes on the ultra-rich, expanding their options when it came to tax avoidance. 
My argument started with numbers. Numbers about the 26 winners and the 3.7 billion losers of the system. This, as I've shown, is no accident. And you've now heard the top 26, and their slightly less well-off buddies, are working hard to keep this system in place. We must also consider now the second defining crisis of our time, climate breakdown. The argument is simple. Billionaires are an exacerbation and a perversion of the growth economy, both as individuals and through the activity that made them their wealth in the first place. The further the growth economy becomes perverted, the greater impact on climate through increased emissions and increased waste. We can begin once more with some numbers. Just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions since 1988. The culprits are unsurprising. Exxon, Shell, BP, Chevron. These companies have generated billions for their shareholders at the cost of putting humanity on the brink of extinction. The ultra-rich are to be blamed not just for their business activities. As Oxfam reported last year, the top 10% are responsible for 50% of consumption emissions. All the same, the ultra-rich have the nerve to tell the developing world that they must change their habits, that they must cut plastic waste, that they must switch to renewable energy. Uh, as Rutger Brabham uh, quipped at the Davos concert, uh, conference, thousands have flown here on private jets to hear David Attenborough speak about climate change. You may think that there are only a few industries that drive climate change. The usual suspects are oil, gas, shipping, etc. But the problem is much deeper than this. As I initially argued, Billionaires are a perversion of the growth model. Everywhere in the world, especially in the West, consumption and waste are growing exponentially. Even the good guys are complicit. Tech companies releasing new products every year, often with only mi minor cosmetic upgrades. Perfectly functional devices being thrown away, filling landfills with batteries uh, and destroying fertile land. And once more, we seldom feel the impact. As you've heard recently in the news, Rich countries pay for poor countries to take out their trash for them. In poorer countries, the regulation is weaker, and, it take, and much more waste finds itself harming people. So who are the winners in this model? Once again, the ultra-rich whose company shares continue to climb in value. As with wealth inequality, it is no surprise that there has been little progress in regulating the industries destroying the planet. The ultra-rich have the most to lose if this model is rethought. They have the most to win if the status quo, where the exploitation of natural resources will continue to make them rich, leaving the global south to bear the majority of the impact. There are no free market incentives for billionaires to cut their consumption or spend millions uh, changing the industry to reduce emissions. The, so the solution, or their solution at least, has been to throw millions of pounds into climate change sceptical lobbying groups, ranging from pseudoscience to downright fake news. The Mercer family, whose fortune was built in the financial sector, is, uh, is known for its political contributions. Uh, perhaps its most famous was $170,000 to the CO2 coalition, a, supposed, a, a supposedly scientific think tank um, that actually advocates for pumping more CO2 into uh, the atmosphere. Once more, we are stuck in a vicious cycle. Billionaires and the ultra-rich have made their fortunes destroying the planet, and they are ready to spend their fortunes to make sure that their cash flow doesn't stop. So let us recall the billionaires' indictment, driving wealth inequality and climate breakdown through their personal and business activities. If being complicit in the world's two most pressing crises and continuing their complicity for the sake of money isn't immoral, I'm really not sure what is. The ultra-rich might, might try to raise one thing in their defence, their philanthropic efforts. This does not come close to absolving the moral guilt of the billionaires. Research has shown that philanthropy is just a drop in the ocean. Many billionaires donate nothing, and others can only give away a small amount of their fortune. Compared to the billions spent on destroying the environment and partisan lobbying, such laudable efforts just fall flat. There are many ways in which philanthropy is flawed. It's been argued ex uh, extensively, in fact, by the third speaker in proposition of this motion that it perpetuates wealth inequality and is profoundly undemocratic. I know my partners in this debate will dispel once and for all the myth that philanthropy can absolve the ultra-rich of their moral guilt. And this should convince you, once and for all, that the billionaires are guilty. Guilty of creating wealth inequality and for driving climate change. Guilty of pushing the world to the brink 
through their pure greed. They are not guilty at law. In fact, probably none of them will ever be punished for their crimes. Morally, however, they are undoubtedly guilty. And it's up to you to make that clear by voting with the eyes tonight. Thank you very much.